Okay, if everybody would take a seat, that would be good. Thank you for coming. Um, just so you know, if you're in the right place, this is the session on scaling wash markets and talking about the evolving roles of corporates, NGOs, and donors. So that's what we're talking about. Hopefully that's what you came here to listen to. Um, so welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. We know it's the post-lunch hour, so we're going to do our best to keep you happy and amused and, and maybe even intrigued. And, um, and, and there will be certainly an audience participation portion of this show. Um, the way things are going to run is I'm going to do some really brief, really brief framing remarks, so about one or two minutes to, to tell you what you're going to see. These three wonderful panelists, who I will introduce shortly, are going to tell the story of an ongoing partnership. Then I'm going to have the privilege of peppering them with a few questions. Um, and then we're going to open it up and let you guys do the same thing. So to frame the session, this is, I think, by World Water Week, an unusual session. We are not reporting back on the results of a particular program or a specific approach. Instead, what you're going to hear is the story of a work in progress. And this is a story which is still unfolding. And I think that makes it an interesting opportunity. And, um, and it certainly takes a little courage uh, for the panelists to stand up here and talk about something that's ongoing as opposed to something that's already been done. Uh, I find it interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have three organizations here which are not necessarily typical of the sector. We have a private company, a, a large privately held American company, which is candid about the fact that it doesn't have that much experience at the base of the pyramid and yet is interested in venturing into that area. We have an NGO, but one that is not, um, uh, that, that operates in a particular way, which is to say that it really only uh, uses market-based approaches, which makes them a little unusual for an NGO. And we have a funder um, that likes to take risks and is, is willing to try new things, recognizing that, uh, uh, that, that, that they don't always have success, but they think the upside from taking risks is worth it. And the three of them have come together for this partnership, which if you look at the bigger, the bigger picture, and I, I think the context of the SDGs is the, the way to frame things um, these days, um, certainly has the potential for innovation, which is really important in the sector because we don't find new and better ways to do things. We're certainly not going to reach uh, the, the SDGs. It has the potential for real scale. And it's a market-based approach so that that lends it the, uh, the opportunity for greater sustainability. So it really is an interesting partnership, uh, but it's still one that is evolving. And so having said that, what the way this is going to work is that's the only slide there's going to be, so you don't have to worry about death by PowerPoint. Uh, instead, what we're going to have here is a story. And it's going to be a story that's told sequentially by the partners. And I'm going to step off stage and sit with you and listen to the story. And once the story is done, uh, I'm going to come back on, as I said, and ask them some questions. And we're going to engage you in the, the Q&A also. So leading off the story will be uh, Tim White, closest to me, of Kohler, uh, then Yi Wei from IDE, and Jonathan Hare of Grand Challenges Canada. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. All right, let's see. Can you guys hear me OK? There we go. So thank you so much. My name is Tim White. I am the business development manager at Kohler Company. And I just wanted to first acknowledge that I'm humbled by the presence in the room here. Um, this is our first World Water Week. And it's been quite overwhelming to hear the, uh, the experiences shared in the room. So I look forward to learning more from you all. Uh, so I thought I'd start a little bit and talk about Kohler as an organization and, and why we're even getting into uh, WASH. And uh, to start there, just uh, as Lewis mentioned, we're a privately held family business. Uh, we're headquartered in Wisconsin which is in the United States. We've been around for around 140 years as a family business. And we, we really got our start in uh, developing products for an up and coming America, and starting with agriculture and then getting into plumbing products. And today our portfolio 
includes uh, bathtubs, toilets, faucets, showers, but we also do engines, generators, golf courses. Um, <laughs> as if, if any of you have watched the PGA Championship, that was last week at a Kohler golf course. So we're a quite diversified company. And you may ask, you know, how did all these things kind of come together? Uh, it's really been with a single mission, which has always been to provide gracious living experiences for all the people that touch our products and services. And so um, where we got into WASH is a reflection on that mission. Taking a look at, you know, graciousness is not something that should be afforded to just an elite population. And so uh, stewardship is a very important part of the Kohler Company. And uh, we've been exploring ways to support the communities in which we have our factories. And one of those clearly was about providing water. Uh, our global footprint is quite large, and the associates and the communities in which they live were struggling for safe water sources. So really started to look into the technologies and the approaches and invited some of the NGO partners to come to speak to Kohler about what we could do to support the communities in which we work. And as an engineer and as an entrepreneur, I personally took a real interest when I found that the majority of the solutions out there uh, I thought could be improved. Uh, so it was an early reflection point. And we started to take a look at it, really starting more as a corporate social responsibility story of what could we do to improve on the technology. The more I dug into it, however, I realized that there's more to the story and more to the challenge than just coming up with an innovative product. And so started to look at the business models and really was inspired by the spectrum of approaches that you all have in approaching the developing world and realized if we want to make a go at this, we really need to find the partners to support something more than just uh, coming out with an improved product. It's how do you come out with an improved solution. And so that's where we went next, is we went on a, a search for what are the right business models, what are the right partnerships, and came across some very inspirational uh, stories from the IDE organization, really showing the evolution of a model of reaching a consumer in a very sustainable way. And so, I, I hope to be able to come to you in a year from now and speak of the successes uh, that we're having. Um, you know, generally, Kohler appreciates the irony that we already are a wash company, but we're just focused on a different demographic. Uh, I think specifically, as, I, as I've skipped over this point, uh, our first entry into the wash uh, area is to look at water filtration and we are coming out with a point of use ceramic water filter uh, in January of 2016. So we're quite excited by that and we're working on some early partnerships to make that story come true. One of those being uh, with IDE. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Yi. Sure, thank you very much, Tim. Can you guys hear there me? Go. Great. Um, a bit of introduction. My name is Yi Wei and I'm the director of IDE's Global Wash Initiative. IDE is an organization that has been around since the early 80s, dedicated to improving the lives and livelihoods of the rural poor. And we started as an agriculture-focused organization um, with treadle pumps and now moving into drip irrigation as it relates to water here. And over the last decade have really built up our wash water sanitation hygiene presence. And as Tim mentioned, um, we do a market-based approach. So we believe that the private sector is a very powerful force um, in terms of delivering affordable, desirable products and services for the poor. And the poor should be treated with the dignity of a customer and not just a beneficiary handed free things they may not want. Um, so with that background, when we encountered Kohler, we thought, great, uh, a private sector actor who wants to get involved in the base of the pyramid markets. And um, generally our approach has been engaging mom and pop small and medium-sized enterprises and demonstrating a business opportunity for them in selling toilets and water filters. Uh, but when you get a large player who is interested in joining the market, that changes the game because they have large um, 
resources and experience with R&D, and perhaps they're better positioned to deliver cheaper, more desirable products faster um, and more effectively. So that was our interest when Kohler entered, and um, we were also open to engaging Kohler from a corporate social responsibility, CSR angle, in that um, corporations are interested in being responsible stewards, IDE can partner with them in making impact in the world and growing our organization, and businesses often understand business principles. So IDE um, uh, was looking for uh, more flexible ways of financing our work because a market-based approach doesn't always lend itself naturally to traditional log frames. Um, so in terms of engaging Kohler, uh, that's how we uh, imagined the engagement, either from a CSR angle or as a market actor angle. Um, initial conversations, I think, took a little <laughs> getting to know each other. Um, I think Kohler uh, was also starting to explore their uh, potential role in the markets. And uh, when we <laughs> discussed the opportunity of entering um, BOP markets, they're like, whoa, we're interested, but um, we've already made uh, investments in developing the product, we're not sure if we're ready to take on a full-scale commercial role yet. Um, and that's where we thought, okay, uh, can we bring in a donor who might be able to de-risk their market rent entry, a donor who's comfortable with taking some risk and um, playing the role of supporting proof of concept. Um, so IDE had an existing partnership with Grand Challenges Canada who is currently funding a sanitation marketing scale-up program in Nepal. And we thought, okay, why don't we engage an existing donor who has this appetite and um, see if we can add in another element where we're bringing in a private sector actor to reach scale for wash markets. Uh, and with that, I guess I'll hand it off to Jonathan. All right, thank you, Yi, um, and thanks to everyone for your, your attention and your presence. Um, what I'd like to do is really quickly outline our nonlinear trajectory um, over our five-year history um, in order to let you understand how we arrived at, at Yi saying perhaps GCC might be the right fit. So we are a Canadian federal government funded nonprofit organization that exists arm length, arm's length from the, um, the government um, in order to fund big ideas with bold ideas with big impact. We've been around for five years at this point we have funded 700 global health innovations at proof of concept stage. So this is this very, very early pure research in the lab um, type innovation. We fund that at approximately $100,000 um, and the project's le uh, length uh, is normally 12 to 18 months, something like this. Our strategy has evolved rapidly over that five year timeline. We started to see some of these early grants uh, wrap up and they demonstrated proof of concept. They had the results validated. And they were knocking on our doors again saying, well, what next? We'd like to start to enter the transition towards scale or we're actually starting to scale. How can you help fund us? So GCC developed a transition to scale program. Initially, this program was just providing a larger ticket size to the grant financing that had, had been providing in the past. So instead of offering $100,000, we now went up to a million dollars in grant financing. This was a great start, and we funded perhaps 20 to 30 of the 700 innovations, although not all of them had achieved proof of concept yet, um, before we realized that perhaps starting to think about different types of capital um, along the full capital stack, so anything from grants to repayable grants, 0% interest loans, sub-market rate loans, flexible repayable uh, loans, convertible notes, peer equity, I'm listing it out on purpose because it's really important, um, might be really, really useful to organizations depending where they are in their um, valley of death um, or as they cross the bridge from pure grant research to pure commercialization um, of go-to-market strategies. Many organizations play within that space and more importantly, as we all know, that the depth of the valley that the bridge is crossing or the length of the bridge varies, right? Meaning the length of time or the amount of financing it takes will vary. Great. So being a, a grant funder, a donor funder, we clearly thought that we're not gonna go to the very end of that spectrum and say we're gonna be a me too type of venture capitalist investor. We're gonna come right here on the very beginning of that bridge and say how do we help de-risk opportunities at their earliest formative stages with different types of capital as appropriate depending on use of proceeds. Excellent. 
We started to do that, not in, in exactly in an opportunistic way, but fairly close. And as we started to fund these 20 to 30 or so, we started to identify these sub-portfolios, areas where we're starting to see um, uh, potential correlation or potential areas of opportunity for folks to collaborate. We also started to see where we might be able to play a larger role in order to drive the greatest impact possible. We are a uh, impact first organization and at this point now that we've taken on different types of capital uh, in terms of what we can provide, a finance second type of organization. This kind of language is really, really important if you're familiar with impact investing. What's really, really important to us is not this next 18 months, but the long-term or longevity of an, or, of, of an opportunity. So we're thinking very, very much about sustainability. Um, I think aligning with the SDGs 2030 timeline is really appropriate. We're not looking for next year, we're looking for the next 15 years. And when we think about that, we think about how do we support an organization beyond just the million dollars, the $1.5 million that we can provide. And so we're starting to think very much about uh, aligning interest across the appropriate partners. We don't fund just product or technology. This is where we largely started. But more importantly, we're thinking very, very much about process innovations, and we're thinking about service delivery innovations. I think you know where I'm going at this point. We obviously funded um, IDE, Service Delivery Implementation Partner. Excellent. We start to think about organizations like Kohler, because these are the folks that can actually pull products or services into the market in the future getting exactly to that sustainability, that longevity piece that I, I mentioned earlier. So all in all, we started at a very ad hoc manner in which we were funding things, and where we're at right now, we're thinking very, very much about funding for systems change. We are still funding the innovations as they start to demonstrate some proof of, uh, proof of uh, demonstrating transition to scale, sorry. But we're doing so in order to then affect um, some policy change or some advocacy type change through that bottom-up approach, as opposed to just supporting an innovation itself and hoping for the best, or trying to support policy change from a, from a government level. Um, and so with that, I think I'll stop there. This is how we were introduced to Kohler um, in this opportunity uh, through IDE, and, and I look forward to the lively discussion. Thanks. So as I put my mic on, I can probably speak loudly enough to to ask me, first of all, where does the partnership stand today? So we, we had a, um, a, an organization that found a product that was interested in marketing, and you've been talking to them, you've been talking to, to the ACC, so what, what is the status of this partnership today? The status, can I on again? <laughs> the status of the partnership today is that we've all come to an agreement of how we would work together uh, how we plan to work together. Um, Kohler has a product that's uh, ready to go to the market, and we have agreed, we, IDE, have agreed to support them in um, exploring market potential of uh, uh, the Nepal context. And um, we are currently doing the last activities on due diligence um, with uh, Grand Challenges Canada. So, if all goes out well, we plan to be able to roll this out in the next couple months. Okay, so um, Tim, um, the product is a water filter. Mm -hmm. Is this a product that is coming out of the CSR side of your shop, or is it coming out of the commercial side, or somewhere in between? Yeah, so we really don't have a CSR side, per se, for product development. So the only natural fit for developing the product was actually within our existing new product development environment, which you know is a machine at a company like Kohler. Uh, so what what we were able to do was engage a very passionate workforce of people, literally starting out as a volunteer workforce hmm. uh, of engineers that were willing to commit time, designers that were coming from across the globe to participate in this design practice and uh, followed the same rules, the, the framework of new product development. So we didn't have to invent that. You know, that's something that an organization like Kohler is already quite good at. So as we became more and more official and looking at this as a business opportunity, it, it grew to the point where we have full-time employees now. And it's almost become the opposite of uh, this is significant enough that this has legs to stand on its own. 
I've got a bunch more questions, <laughs> but I'll come back to you on. The, no, actually, I'm going to follow up for a sec. <laughs> All right. Um, most companies, when they develop a product, they develop for markets they know. This is a market that you guys don't have much experience in. And that presents a variety of risks that your company is probably not used to. Um, is, there, is your company treating this differently because the markets are different and because this is, to some extent, unexplored territory? Well, I, I think the insights for the end user, absolutely, that's different. You know, it's not our traditional customers, so we don't want to make an assumption of how they're going to interact with our product or what their problems are in the first place. So very early on, I mentioned already, we brought on uh, some NGOs to help us understand the needs. I traveled to many communities to witness firsthand. And then uh, really a stroke of luck and some great partnerships uh, with uh, PATH mm -hmm. organization, Tufts University, World Vision, and a few others. We really quickly put together a product that we felt was going to address the needs of the market. But because of those relationships, we fast-tracked some of those insights that would have taken Kohler probably years to really do on our own. But within Kohler, are there expectations that this product would be similar to a new bathtub that you were going to sell in North America? Or is there a recognition that this may be a slightly different animal? Are you speaking to financials or just general How do you treat it? Yeah, what are the expectations and the timing, right. the returns? Is it different for this product, or they have, no, do they I, have the same expectations? I think the general rules are similar, but there's a relaxation of the traditional rules for a return on investment. And I think that's because our leadership have identified that there's more than just profit involved in this type of a program. So we're looking more at this as a way to make impact. And when you think of measuring impact, your return is measured in different ways. So there was, you know, there's a bare minimum requirement that I had to meet as per any kind of uh, organizational requirements as far as financials, timing, resource constraints. But I think there was a bit of a relaxation because our leadership appreciated that there was a lot more to this than just the traditional bathtub. Interesting. Jonathan, um, when GCC looks at an opportunity like this, do you sort of go out and look at other water filters? Do you look at other types of partnerships? How do you evaluate um, a partnership like this? What's the context that you use for that? Is it just about the health impact? Or what's the process like? That's a really good question. We, we absolutely do begin with the potential health impact. Um, and as I was trying to articulate in my opening, we aren't looking for that short-term health, health impact. Um, we are looking for that sustained, long-term health impact. As soon as I say this, the word sustained, then I am thinking about a financial um, element to that. What is underlining the possibility for that greater um, health impact? So when we're looking at uh, evaluating an opportunity, that's where we start. Um, in order to meet that objective, as I said, there needs to be a financial component. And that makes us think about very much the, the strength or the quality of the partners in which we work. One thing I didn't mention in the opening is that while we provided grants that were unmatched at that proof of concept stage, all of our dollars in the transition to scale financing require at least a one-to-one -one leverage match. Uh, it's a great um, for our government to see that the public dollars that go in are being matched by, in many cases, private dollars. So we really seek to evaluate the strength of the partnership from a financial aspect as well. Uh, and that means, one, the ability to, to be aligned right now, but more importantly, um, continue on with the pro project over its existence. We also evaluate underneath all of that the, fi the potential financial return for our investments. That, that I want to make that clear as well. Um, maybe I, I can stop there, because it really is that order. We evaluate health impacts, and we evaluate the financial impact, and both of those are, 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 are considered vis-a-vis -vis the strength of the partners in which we work. So I'm going to push on that one a bit, which is, I've seen a lot of situations where you can have a trade-off between the financial return and the ability to serve the poor. It can be as simple as the fact that if you price a product at a lower price point, more people will be able to afford it, but in turn, the financial viability of the venture itself is, is reduced. That must have been a, a challenge, particularly since you guys fund uh, market-based approaches that you've seen. 
Do you have a, a way of managing those sorts of trade-offs, or is this something that you just sort of manage on a case-by-case -case basis? I think it's a little bit more developed than case-by-case -case at, at this point. Um, we have a portfolio at the transition to scale uh, side of the house uh, of around 50 opportunities that we funded. That portfolio is quite diverse. There's product, there's service, there's process innovations that we funded. Some of these things are still just eking their way out of the very rudimentary research type phase work. Some of them are raising series A rounds and already in market and are almost EBITDA positive. So that's a really broad spectrum, obviously. The types of financing that we therefore provide uh, varies uh, accordingly. And the types of impact, shorter or long, uh, is obviously different as well. Um, Sorry, what was the first part? I'm, I'm really sorry. No, it's okay. The, the, the question is, how do you manage that trade-off? I mean, yeah. you, you could say to Kohler, look, you need to price this at X level because otherwise you're not going to really reach the base. And they might say, I can't make yeah. money doing that. Right. So um, uh, when, when you get involved, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, thank you. I was just trailing off there on my own. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, where I was going with the portfolio is we've got opportunities that are a little bit earlier stage where we need to do a little bit more de-risking. There are others where we can syndicate with, with, with other partners and we can really take advantage of, of, uh, of a market opportunity that's been well-defined and developed. So when looking at this opportunity, we are willing to look at uh, different types of capital, perhaps layering things appropriately or just providing grants, grant financing in order to get that, that mix right, to develop the model enough um, in order to, to get it running, up and running, hopefully there's an opportunity to provide follow-on financing. Is something, again, speaking to that longer-term um, scenario, we don't provide funding once and then we're done. We have the opportunity to find uh, follow-on finance, and then that might be an opportunity to provide uh, different types of financing. The last thing that I'll say, um, and I'm sl saying it slightly tongue-in-cheek, is that our existence, uh, we're only five years old, we started providing grants and nothing but grants. Providing a, a type of instrument that allows for a financial return, even if it's just a slight amount, is a really interesting departure from um, where we started. Um, we were originally started with um, CETA, the Canadian CETA. Uh, we're now in DFAT-D, uh, associated with DFAT-D. That's just 100% risk capital that we know that we we're going to lose at proof of concept stage. Being able to have a return scenario, even if it's marginal, is a huge departure from where we came, and I think that's a really, really important uh, differentiator. Great. Yi. I, it, it turned out that you're sitting in the middle here, <laughs> um, which we didn't plan, but I think is probably the right place to put you. Uh, the IDE has a long history as you said, going back to treadle pumps and drip irrigation and, and, and um, really is a, was one of the few organizations that's been over a long period of time dedicated to market-based approaches. When you look at the, this sort of opportunity as opposed to something where, as you said, traditionally you might come up with a product but then get it manufactured locally. When you look at something like this, why is it worthwhile to pursue this opportunity? Because it, it, it takes more effort, right? I mean, in some ways, you, you, you have to work with one company, you have to cultivate them, you have to work with the funder. What about this was attractive to IDE? I think what's most attractive about this partnership uh, speaks to two things that IDE has always held up as principles um, for our work. And the two things are scale and sustainability. And so we've always been a proponent of the market-based approach because when you work with the private sector, you're not limited by the amount of grant funding you have. Businesses can make as much money as they can as long as they're willing customers who want to buy the product. And so when you go through the market, you can reach many more customers because there is that um, self-generating cycle of incentives of profit and uh, aspiration for owning a product or having a service. And so Kohler plays no different a role than the small mom-and-pop businesses we work with in um, the rural areas of Asia and Africa and Latin America, except that they are potentially available to deliver scale faster um, because of the capabilities, because of their R&D capacities, um, and 
sustainability is a key part of that as well. So when you are structured as a business, um, you're not dependent on grant funding, and you can always adapt to however the markets change. Um, and Kohler, having been around for almost 150 years, I think speaks very clearly to what a business can do. Um, and so we'd like to develop systems and not just one-time projects that serve the needs of the poor. Great. Um, I'm going to open it up in a minute to the audience, so get your questions ready. I think there are, there's a mic that will be passed around. Um, I want to come back to something that Tim said, though, which was the this is a technology, and it sounds like you guys have gone on a, a, a journey where realizing it's not just about the technology, it's about the markets and the, the context in which it's used. But you mentioned there was MIT, there was Tufts, there was PATH. Just talk a little bit about how you arrived at this technology and this choice of product. And I, I think there were some things you built on that, that were there before that allowed you to get there quicker than you otherwise might have. Yeah, and I, I think the first thing I'll acknowledge is there's no one right solution. You know, I've had some very good conversations today even on that topic that, uh, you know, depending on the water situations or depending on the needs of the end user, there's no one right solution. So I'll just first and foremost say that. But there was one right solution for our company. And uh, you know, that's largely because of reflection on our competencies in ceramics. You know, we kind of the joke around Kohler is we've worked for 140 some years to make toilets that don't leak because that's what our customers expect. And from a ceramics perspective, the way the product works in a filter is it does leak. But you know, that irony really inspired our ceramics engineers to look into you know, how can we take our assets, our knowledge of ceramics development, utilize our manufacturing capabilities globally as we have ceramics manufacturing facilities in most of the water-starved areas. And really, so it was, it was a real good fit for us. And, and I think also as you reflect on the branding of Kohler, we're about providing beautiful, aspirational products. So to put two and two together, it's like, why wouldn't we make a ceramic water filter that represents an aspirational product? Because what we've learned in the early stages of working with our partners is that the consumer at the base of the pyramid is driven by the same aspirational forces as our customer at the uh, top of the pyramid. And let's reflect on that for a moment and not think that we could offer anything short of what our consumer in the developed world would expect. And so we had to revalidate, obviously, what is aspiration and what are pro product performance goals. And we did that through our partners. So um, yeah, it was just the right fit for us. I think as we learn along the way, we'll find that there are additional products that we can offer. You know, it's, it's not any stretch of the imagination to consider our current portfolio of products and see where this could eventually go in sanitation and hygiene. So who knows what's next? But the, there was a story there about MIT and Tufts and PATH. I'll just give that one briefly. Well, that one was kind of serendipitous. Uh, you know, we had an existing relationship with a professor at MIT who had done Consult, uh, consulting to Kohler on some of our innovative showering products, and he introduced me to the D-Lab at MIT, went out there and spent some time learning about the design for the Developing World Laboratory, and um, met some very inspiring people there, and I asked them, hey, can you provide some consulting services to the Kohler company? Uh, they said, we would love to help you, but we are actually overburdened right now with programs so would you be comfortable working with our friends down the road at Tufts University? And uh, it just took, I don't know if any of you know Danielle Latang at Tufts, but you spend two minutes with her and you would hire her in an instant to provide some guidance. And uh, so I think it's been wonderful because then Danielle introduced us to folks at PATH, to folks at World Vision, folks at PSI, and, and also at IDE. So the network is phenomenal. Great, I, I mean, one of the things this illustrates, I think, is the, the term public-private partnership PPPs is thrown around a lot, but when you get down to it, I, I, I think of it 
not as sort of partnerships for partnership's sake, but rather the instrumentality of it, which is you guys have come together because you each have a different competency and a, a, a different area of, of interest, and it happens that in this case it works, or it seems to be working. That will be determined as time goes on pretty well. So with that, um, I'm going to turn to the audience, and if I know you and I don't call you by name, it's because there are some bright lights in my eyes, and I can see the people, but I can't really see the faces. So, uh, gentlemen right there. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, oh, hold on a sec. Could you introduce yourself, where uh, you're from? Yeah, David, and, uh, uh, David Pankretz with IDE Canada. Uh, the, uh, addressing uh, the fellow from Kohler, uh, when we were renovating our house, we went out looking for plumbing supplies, and we saw a wide range of plumbing supplies, some of them made by Kohler, some by others, and like some of them priced completely out of reach for us, and, and, and some of them priced very low, and we thought we could do better, we hit somewhere in the middle. So it was clear that the plumbing companies were spending time figuring out different markets and supplying products for different markets. Is, supply, is doing that process for the base of the pyramid a different process uh, than you're doing when you're, when you're uh, meeting the needs of customers in North America, or is it, is it exactly the same? And if different in what way? No, that's an excellent question. And I think the reflection immediately is in a developed market, like shopping for plumbing products in Canada, it's a well-established, uh, you know, a good, better, best scenario is typically how we refer to it. And uh, that's in a mature market. What I will offer is we don't have the answers yet for will that same scenario develop in the, the base of the pyramid. I, I think probably philosophically we would expect that it would. Um, we're about giving consumers choices generally, so I think we would eventually support that. Uh, I think, though, what, uh, what we have to understand is testing the market at various points. And, you know, while Kohler is, is very happy with working with IDE, we're also reaching out to several other implementation partners to test out different market approaches. And, try to feel out what's making the most impact and what's working the best for Kohler. And in that trial over the next year or so, some natural segregation of the market may occur and it may be very regional depending on what partners are strong in separate regions. Did that answer your question? Yee, do you want to? Yeah, if I could jump in here. Um, so IDE currently develops uh, markets for sanitation and water products. And a question that we get asked often is, do you offer uh, a, a variety of products that people can choose from? And I think the uh, point that Tim just made right now about the maturity of the market is really salient here because the markets we're entering often don't really exist. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. And if they do, they're quite fragmented. And so the first objective is to get a product, a product that people actually want and are willing to spend money on purchasing and using. And so our first order of action is to get one product there. And as the market matures, as people are exposed to the product, the category of the product, then we can also think about adding on other product items. The other constraint that we face, a very real constraint, is the supply side constraint. Um, we work with small businesses often who may be illiterate, who may have one part-time laborer, and if you want them to produce three, four different products at their little shop, it often gets very uh, complicated for them. And so um, for us, we use the human-centered design process, which uses three lenses. Um, desirability, what do people actually want? Feasibility, is it technically possible, both from a technological point of view and also from a supply chain point of view? And um, is it viable? Is it financially viable? Can the businesses make money um, sustainably? So when we talk about different product options, it's great to just think about whether or not um, customers would like three products, um, but is the market mature enough to handle that? So I'm going to provide a little context here, um, which is it, it, this is relatively new. First of all, that uh, um, the people... Uh, who are getting the products are considered customers and not beneficiaries. And I think just considering them customers 
creates a whole different dialogue. And the, the other thing that's happened is often when these products were developed originally, the market wasn't actually the customer. The market was an NGO that would in turn often give the product away. And I've seen this happen in the water and sanitation sector and in other sectors. One of the advantages of bringing the private sector in and bringing in organizations that are market-based is they will go back and there may be a product. I mean, I, there is a standard in East Africa, there's, there's a standard squat plate that's used for rural toilets. But it was, you know, that had been around for a long time. But at some point, um, IFC and WSP and some others came in and said, what would happen if we actually did a little bit of market research and asked people what they wanted? And when they did that, they came up with not a radically different product, but a product that had some differences, including color and you know, where you put your feet and things like that. And it made a big difference. I mean, the market accepted it more. So that, that moving from thinking about beneficiaries to customers is one of the, one of the great advantages of market-based. Eddie, I do know your name, so um, I'll call on you. There you go, right other side. Hi, my name's Eddie Perez, and I'm with the uh, Center for Global Safe Wash at Emory University. And uh, great, great presentation and nice storytelling. Uh, uh, That's great connection. And you should be in t on TV, Lewis, as a <laughs> moderator. We were thinking radio. <laughs> now, Lewis, I, have a, I have a face made for radio. Great. <laughs> no, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> your voice is very To be funny. fully transparent, <laughs> Lewis asked me to be the heckler here. So uh, You're one of the me. people I asked to be the heckler. Uh, okay. <laughs> And, um, and Lewis did also open up by saying, you know, this is a good context in terms of the uh, forthcoming SDGs, which have a very strong principle on reducing the equity gap and reaching the poorest. And so particularly when it comes to the private sector, there's a lot of rhetoric about reaching the bottom of the pyramid. And Lewis, when he was still at the Gates Foundation, funded a think tank to look at case studies around the world in different sectors that said they were trying to reach the bottom of the pyramid, and none of them did. So they kind of were breaking that myth. And so part of my heckling is to try to get you guys to recognize that there is a pyramid, and what I've seen in the best case scenario is that through product development and different financial approaches, you can move down further the pyramid, but to reach the bottom of the pyramid, no one has done that yet. And I think that goes to your other question, which didn't still get quite answered is, what is your metrics of success? So is it gonna be sales of water filters? Forget the profit part, I, that was confusing, I guess, you're, you know, too conf is it sales of water filters? Or is it actually people at the bottom of the pyramid buying those? Because those are two very different things, and, in, and health impact. Great. So, you know, so, so those... Um, so those were Eddie's usual really easy questions, and so um, have a go. I, I have some thoughts too, but uh, I'll, I'll, I, you, you want to, uh, Tim, you want to? I had a, an initial thought is, uh, yeah, so again, a reflection on the fact we don't quite know how low is low, and uh, I think that because we're trying a number of approaches, some of them from complete subsidy, there is an opportunity for the Kohler filter to reach the bottom, but probably not in a sustainable marketed way like the IDE organization would prefer. So I can't say that we're going to be the successful model for sustainability at the true bottom, but uh, I think that's not that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater for this program, and I think we should try to find a, a variety of approaches to be able to, at least in uh, not the base, but further up, provide a sustainable model. And I think there's probably some trickle-down learnings from what we, we gather at that middle bottom that would apply eventually. Yi? Yeah, I love this question because it's a question that comes up at every conference, um, every conversation about market-based approaches. And I think it's one of the biggest criticisms about market-based approaches in that um, they're not Markets are not incentivized to reach the poorest of the poor, and we fully acknowledge that. But I think there's been this false binary that's been set up between the idea of market-based approaches and subsidy, which is usually the mechanism or approach um, affiliated with reaching poorest of the poor. Um, and I, I just want to be frank up here. We're an NGO that's grant-funded. Everything we do is subsidized. It's just, is it subsidized on the front-end, customer-facing end, or is it subsidized on the back-end? 
And we believe that if we're subsidized on the back end, we can leverage the scarce resources we do have to reach more people. Um, and IDE's approach to market development is that we acknowledge the market is not going to reach the poorest of the poor first, um, but we should use resources in a sequenced manner so that we minimize market distortions so that in spending X amount of dollars in training businesses, incentivizing businesses to sell to the people who are willing and able to buy, then we can use the money that's left over uh, to actually subsidize the poor, and that might be direct subsidies. So, um, but it's not a black and white. In between, you have uh, financing, and we found that with access to consumer financing, you increase demand by 300% at market price. So people may not be absolutely poor, they just may be cash poor. And at the far end, the poorest of the poor, we acknowledge there might be people who may never be able to afford a toilet at market price, even if you finance it. In that case, can we develop some subsidies that are um, minimal in market distortionary effects? For example, can we channel the uh, subsidy through a microfinance institution and do very specific targeting so that it's still being implemented by market actors and those who are willing and able to purchase are still doing so with their own resources. Jonathan, did you want to weigh in? Um, maybe a, a really quick add-on. Um, as a funder, we, we look for health outcomes um, in all of our deals. We don't look for health outputs or just access numbers. Um, we, are, we, are, we work very, very hard with all of the organizations that we fund um, in order to generate health outcomes. And obviously we do as much due diligence ahead of time in order to make sure that that's, that's a possible solution. Um, we do that in a number of ways, of course. Um, a portion of our funding many times will go to M&E systems, strategy or, or implementation um, of such. All of our reports require that as key milestones along the course of funding or as a part of a final report. And we often find um, that organizations will use uh, dual market strategies, either developed and developing economies or um, also um, public versus private sector plays within each of the countries in, in which they operate. I'm not really addressing, uh, answering your question uh, head on, yeah. but we try to keep organizations um, as focused as possible to get those price points uh, as low as possible. Um, so, uh, can Eddie, I just quickly add? I no, mean, Eddie, let me just, uh, okay. I, I, I'm going to try to answer your question head on. Right. Um, but I had a constructive uh, suggestion. Oh, okay, <laughs> you go first then. So the issue of sustainable financing and to reach the bottom of the poor, if you look at the U.S., where our government is trying to promote alternative energy, we have fiscal policies, so tax breaks to the producers of the products, of solar cells, for example, and tax breaks to the consumers. So that's a sustainable, as long as we keep paying taxes and et cetera, financing stuff. So, but that means you have to broaden your partnership. It's not just the private sector. Mm -hmm. It means that to get to the bottom of the pyramid, you need to bring in governments, and they need to be, you know, understand the dynamics and, and provide fiscal incentives to reach the bottom. And that doesn't distort the market. These solar guys, they got, went out of business, but not because of the subsidies. Mm -hmm. You know, the, some are doing well. But, so just a thought, when it's a public-private partnership, we don't really have the fourth chair here of, of, the, of a government. And, and that was one of the issues we discussed. Um, but I, I'm going to go back to your original question because, you know, at, at Gates and before that when I was at IFC, having dealt a lot with market-based approaches, I actually commissioned some studies on this. The first one many years ago was to look at flashlights because those had become ubiquitous and almost anybody could afford one of those. And the second one was to look at cell phones. And just because those also, I mean, famously, there are more cell phones than toilets than there are in India. Um, so when you look at the development of products that eventually do reach the base of the pyramid, clearly they don't start out by reaching the base of the pyramid to start, as these folks were saying. They try to reach a price point where they can make enough money that they can stay in business. One of the things happens over time is they get better at making that product. Over time, with economies of scale, with learning, the price of the product will drop. And so in some cases, products do become cheap, cheap enough so that really poor people can afford them. Now, there is a big difference between a consumer product like a flashlight and a consumer durable, what we're talking about here. 
that's clearly where things like microfinance and other financing comes in. But you're also going to hit a point, as the, the panel was saying, where you're just not going to be able to reach everybody if it's a more expensive product. And Eddie, to your point, that's the point where subsidies come in. And the question then is how smart are the subsidies? Do you subsidize people on the supply side, or do you say, uh, you know, do you, as you were saying, can you find a way to subsidize the people who you know need the product, maybe with vouchers or some other way, so that they can go do it without distorting the market? And I agree with you totally, Eddie. There are a lot of public benefits out of, to, to Grand Challenge Canada's point. They do this because of the public benefit, because of the health benefits. There are a lot of public benefits out of this. The question is, is there a way using the market to get as much as you can, if you will, to exploit the market forces and the financing available there, so that when you do need to resort to the government funding, you're targeting it as well as possible, and you're using as little of it as you need. So, is Steve, is that... Uh, so, yep. Uh, yeah, Stephen Sugden, Water for People. Um, on my travels around the globe, talking to lots of customers, there's one product that always strikes and it, it is top of people's list regarding desirability, and that is ceramic uh, squatting bowls. Ceramic, ceramic, ceramic. This is what people like. This is what they aspire to as being a beautiful solution. So we imported, um, we found a supplier of a, of a bowl within India, um, and we found that it actually cost $5.75 to take that product from India all the way to Embera in Mozambique. It then, by the time that it got into Malawi with the transport, with the taxes, with the duty, with the VAT on the duty, with the VAT on the VAT, that was actually $18 before there was put in any price on it. Now, although, Cola, you say that, um, and I've been to places like Bolivia where I've seen small fa uh, factories, ceramic factories, set up in people's back gardens and, and grow. What strikes me as being one of the real problems is that there's no ceramics manufacturer seems to be in Africa. I don't know why, um, but this barrier, this import, is, is a real problem. So perhaps, although you think the skills, you, you rightly point out your skills are in the, the design, but is there a way you can get the manufacturing process down, and that's the, way, the real way to reduce costs? In response to Eddie's, um, the Malawi Revenue Authority now gains its income from the amount of tax it raises. So it's been, had its capacity built by DFID. So it, it, its answer when you say, will you reduce the tax and the import and the VAT, the answer is no, because it affects their bottom line. So it's working against it. I just wonder to throw, you know, to, the products are there. I think we know what people want. It's, it's the supply chain that we've got the real problem with. This is great. Everybody's asking such easy questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tim, yeah. I'm glad you're answering this one, not me. <laughs> no, so I think already, uh, so to acknowledge, you have a very good point. I think the Kohler manufacturing footprint may already have some opportunities to be considered local in some instances, but will we ever be in a backyard model? Uh, most likely not, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, you know, one of the the rules that I was given is, and it's, it's the motto we all have, is do no harm. And not that I'm suggesting that backyard models would ever harm anyone. We feel that in a carefully controlled factory environment, we can guarantee that safety of the, of the life critical part. So I don't see us setting up shop in that specific way, but I would also say there's some advantages to a factory environment as well, which is economies of scale that you won't appreciate in a backyard uh, shop. And then also, don't underestimate the ability of a large organization to move product efficiently across the world also. So while you may be challenged through the steps of the process you illustrated, I think that we have a very skilled trafficking department that may have some efficiencies that you may not have. And so I would ask, you know, that would be part of this relationship is let's explore what makes the most sense. Is it to 
utilize empty capacity in a freight container from the Kohler factory headed in a general direction and we get free shipping that way. Or is it, let's be smart about the distribution as well. And, and uh, Steve, the, uh, Tim mentioned a, a PATH in there. PATH is a Seattle-based organization, Program for Appropriate Technology and Health, that does a lot of product development. What he was referring to was actually a, a project that my team funded when I was at Gates, which was trying to come up with a, a commercial water filter. And I guess one answer to your question is it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can actually be a hybrid. So what they came up with ultimately, I, I think, provided some benefit to Kohler, but didn't work out the way they had planned. They realized that there were a variety of water filters that people wanted but that there was a core of that water filter, that the actual filtration part, and they thought that that needed to be manufactured centrally, but it's not a very bulky part. It's, it's a relatively small piece of ceramic. It's not a toilet. It's, it's about you know, the size of your hand or something. And it's one thing to have to ship a toilet, something else to ship that, right. and then locally to source the parts that go around it. So it, it can't do that with a toilet, but they're, you know, the sort of product they're talking about here maybe you split the difference right. and, and you can centrally manufacture and have quality control on the really, uh, on the most technologically advanced part of it, but the bucket that surrounds it, maybe you get that locally. Right. And if I may just add a very quick point, um, someone brought up earlier the idea of process over product and when we're working in six different markets across the global wash portfolio, you have six different market uh, conditions and in certain market conditions, maybe the right setup is a partnership with um, a local manufacturing company like we have with RFL in Bangladesh. And so um, it's not to say that our partnership with Kohler will only go forward if they manufacture in the U.S. It's just what makes the most sense financially and product-wise uh, for the customer in this particular market context. Great. A lot of questions. This is great. We've got plenty of time. The woman here. Hi, thank you. I'm Vandana Verma from IKEA Foundation. Uh, it was fantastic to see this uh, collaboration, bringing this business approach and bringing the product to the poor. And we at Foundation are also graduating from very subsidy-based approach to market-based approach. So in that regard, it was fantastic to hear your story. I have one question, is that when you are designing these products for poor, to what extent uh, the people who stand to benefit from your products are involved into designing? Because that is very important. And uh, my other question you have already answered about financial inclusion. So I would like to hear a little bit more strategy around that. I guess I can start. Okay. Um, so the people who are benefiting from the product, the ones who are buying, the customers, are very much involved um, in the process that IDE uses, which I alluded to earlier, the human-centered design approach. Literally what it is is our team goes into the field almost living in the villages for two months, taking an ethnographic approach, anthropological approach, understanding how they run their lives from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, understanding what drives them to want to own a toilet or a water filter, and then we go to the drawing board and think, okay, what does this mean? What are the principles that should go into designing a product? Come up with a couple ideas, then take them back to the field, get their feedback, go from low res, low resolution prototypes, um, and over the course of a year, end up with a high resolution prototype that we feel have been validated by their feedback to then be sent to manufacturing or um, engage with in the um, supply chain. So that's a quick summary. And um, I'm not sure how Kohler does it in the domestic markets in the Western countries, but I will like to speak to that. No, and uh, I don't think it's that much different. I think it's just a different demographic. I will say that this was an unusual circumstance because of the body of work that PATH had already done, funding through the Gates Foundation, and, and, and Lewis has been... Uh, describing some of that background, which I found very interesting because it came long before our time, but essentially it was a body of work, a guideline uh, that researched what the end users, the customers really wanted. So we were able to leverage that uh, guideline and it got down to what type of plastic you should use, how big of the filter should it be, what should be the flow rate, uh, it talked about aspirational qualities of it, 
And that's just not something that the private sector is used to getting. You know, if we're in a highly competitive environment, that's like gold. <laughs> and so it actually took a while for us to even appreciate how valuable that information was because we're not used to getting that. You know, we usually have to create that research. So that's the more traditional model is we have to fund it ourselves. We have to go in and we have to do that exploration. And, and I would just suggest, you know, as you listen in the room and you have product ideas yourselves and you want the ear of a large plumbing manufacturer for a moment, please come up to us because <laughs> we don't want to insist on any one solution. We want to leverage the experiences of the people in this room. So please feel free to uh, talk to us and, and maybe there's some additional shortcuts to help us get to market faster with solutions. So in, in some ways this is gratifying to me because we spent a boatload of money on that PATH project <laughs> and knowing that, that, that it's had a life after the project as a funder is really nice. Um, and I can tell you that when they did that, they engaged a group in India called Quicksand, which is basically the IDO, not IDE, but the IDEO of India, IDEO was really the originator of human-centered design. That's why you have handheld devices and other things. And in the high-tech arena, they developed these, this human-centered design approach. But the great news is that that has been um, adapted. And IDEO actually has a nonprofit now that will go in and help other organizations do this. But the, that has... Uh, along with uh, other things over the last 10 years actually become something of a new discipline, which is actually listening to the market, listening to the customers and understanding them well enough that if you build a product or a service that you have a greater likelihood they're actually going to want to pay for it or, and use it. So, gentlemen, here has been... I'll get you, Jeff. Ron Denham, Toronto. Rotary International. I'm very interested in this discussion because for the last 10 years, I've spent my life at the bottom of the pyramid. And there are viable examples. In fact, if I were to suggest that girls in school are pretty close to the bottom of the pyramid, I think you'd agree with that. And there's a company in Kampala. There were a couple graduates from McGill, I don't know why Canada's always there, they created a company called Afripads. Mm -hmm. They are now manufacturing from local materials and using local labor, a highly successful operation. But let me come back to filters. I'm concerned about the concept that we, in the highly civilized, high economy world, should be producing and shipping and delivering over there, when there are opportunities in that country. And the gentleman here who spoke about the logistics issue is right on. It is difficult to move things from one place to another. So I come back to the example of filters, and I think of the Biosan filter, designed by David Mance, University of Calgary, which is now being manufactured in the home. It's a simple concrete prism, hollow, which has sand and gravel, and that will support a school or a home. So I think when we talk marketing and sales, and I was very interested in this question about feedback from the market, because I think all of this conversation so far has been top down. What would be good for cola? So I was glad somebody said, what does the consumer want? And is this an industrial product or a consumer product? And I don't like the word sustainability, by the way. In our field in Rotary, we say, if you have to subsidize it, it ain't sustainable in the longer term. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for marketing at the bottom of the pyramid, but engaging local labor. And economies of scale are very important in our society where labor costs 15, 20, 30 dollars. But if I'm paying somebody a dollar an hour or a dollar a day even, I'm not looking for economies of scale. I want to create employment. I want to manufacture as much as possible in that community. It may be Kampala, it may be Nairobi, it may be Arusha. Okay. But I think this is the focus that we need to adopt when we are talking about sustainability and scale. So, um, you've raised several points there, some of which I think may have been addressed already. I'd point out that IDE has a really long track record of 
developing products and manufacturing products locally. So this is, I mean, one of the interesting things here is this is not an organization, this isn't their first rodeo. They've been doing this for some time and that they find it interesting to think about a product that would be manufactured by a larger or a, a, a multinational organization. I, I think that comes out of an organization that to my understanding is in fact very user-centered. I think the other thing I would add is that the market is a really good source of discipline. So that if the product that these guys produce doesn't sell, the, you know, th that's going to be the feedback on the product, uh, on, on the project pretty quickly. But um, you did raise a bunch of points, some of which I think have been answered. I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to add. No, I, I think I'll, I'll address a couple of them. And I don't disagree at all about the, 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 uh, the vitality or the viability of the Biosan product. But I, I would push back and say, when you're considering local economies, I don't think that that is solely restricted to a manufacturing environment. I think there are jobs that can be created through sales, service, distribution, that are equally viable. And so I would look for the relationship to evolve into, let's not just think about manufacturing as a job, let's think about all the other economies that this opens up. So I, I think I'll leave it with there because I, I probably assume he has some points as well. I think Lewis and Tim capture a lot of the um, points I was going to make as well. I mean, most of our private sector engagement is with private sector actors. But for IDE, our question is, what can we do to most quickly and most effectively impact the lives and livelihoods of the rural poor? Um, and it's about the cheapest, best product getting into the hands of the poor. So whether or not it's local manufacturing or whether or not it's manufacturing in the U.S., it depends on what's available. So if we have a player like Kohler who's interested in playing, great, let's look at what makes sense in the markets they want to enter. Can they work with the local manufacturer so that we can bring down the cost of transportation? Um, in certain countries, like in Cambodia, the latrine product is a poor flush latrine with a ceramic pan. No one is making ceramics in Cambodia, so we have to import it from Vietnam. We looked into setting up a local ceramics manufacturing plant, but that was going to be extremely expensive and then ultimately raise the price for the end user. So all these considerations are taken into account for. Like I said, not, no market is the same. The principles of how markets operate and the principles of how we do product and service and business model design stay the same. And, and the easy latrine is sort of from Cambodia, the design they came up with actually came out of a guy from IDO who was traveling around. But th there's something about an aspirational product. And, and certainly the easy latrine in Cambodia is an aspirational product because it was designed based on input from um, uh, the market, the, the local people. And I, I suspect one of the challenges of the slow sand filter is it may not seem as aspiration. It may be a perfectly good product and may work, but at the end of the day, it's not just what works, it's what people want. And so to some extent, there, you know, aspiration is part of it. So Jonathan, did you want to? Um, I just wanted to pull back for one second and speak to this, this space that I feel Grand Challenges Canada really plays in. There's so much uh, variability, nuance, complexity, complication in this super early stage financing um, arena as we try and support organizations as they bump along their life cycle. And um, we, I'm trying to respond to the comment, uh, sir, that you made around the, um, if we need to provide subsidies, then in the long term there's no sustainability. And I, and I, I really, I, I find that difficult to answer. We have a few examples where that may be true, of course. We also have other examples where we've provided grant financing to subsidize private equity investors to come in, to cushion their, 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 their risk and juice their returns theoretically, who have then gone on to raise uh, additional financing rounds, which is very, very traditional uh, return risk um, scenarios. We have a few of these case studies where I, I, I'm just not sure it's as simple as if subsidy comes in now that it's not sustainable in the long term. I, I think... Well, I even, short, even, short, even, short even term long term subsidy, I think is yeah, great. But even long term subsidies, there's very few of us in the developed world who get water or sanitation that's not subsidized uh, by our local governments in, in, in one way or another. But I'm going to move on. Yeah. There were other questions out here. Wow, there are a number of them. Um, 
Jeff, you uh, you'd had your hand up, and then I will recognize the person in the back. If, oh, you wait. Okay. Best for last. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Vicky Bolam from Lixor, and I look forward to speaking oh. to you offline later. Um, Can you explain? I, I know who Lixor is, but you may want to explain that. So Lixor is now what I believe is the world's largest uh, plumbing fixtures and fittings company. Uh, we bought American Standard and uh, Grow It, and we have the Japan's second biggest uh, toilet maker. Um, so we're also involved now in the BOP market and uh, are developing a toilet for the urban poor. So I'd just like to say that um, we might challenge your, uh, the common market understanding of ceramic being aspirational. We're hoping to have a, a new aspirational solution. <laughs> um, but, um, but back to the conversation, I think uh, what we've learned over the last uh, six months to a year, and I feel I haven't quite heard yet in this discussion, is, um, you know, scalability. So how are you really addressing scalability? So product is, aspirational product is definitely one part, but it's, it's absolutely not the whole story to um, scalability, I think, as we found with the Sato Pan, which uh, ID worked with, with American Standard. Um, we're, at the moment, we've made the decision not to go all the way down to the end user. We've made the decision to do a B2B business, to get into the BOP business. Uh, it makes much more financial sense, and it, it allows us to play to our strengths, business to business. Um, so again, I, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, um, where does scalability come in? Because you know, having a great product is fantastic, but it, you know, we've had experiences in the past where a great product has not been able to get to scale in the field. Good well, luck. No. I, I assume that I'd be the natural one to respond. So thank you, and I, and I welcome many viewpoints, uh, including from my competitors. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think my first reflection would be define scale. You know, I think the founder of IDE has one notion of what scale is, and we may have another. Um, so, but this project has really, for us, helped us consider what scale is. Because in our toilet world, scale may be a program that sells 100,000 toilets a year. That might be a very good sized program. But when you're approaching, by conservative estimates, still 700 million, if not many, many more, I don't know how to have the conversation about scale. But what I can comfortably say is that I would never let uh, scale scare me and that you know, I would, I would not approach a market, and I know this has been some criticism of, of Paul's theories, I would never not approach something because I couldn't reach 700 million people. For us, it's about making impact, and impact may be one person, it may be 10 million people. So, Vicky, I'm probably dancing a bit around the, the question, and maybe it's good to have offline, but for us, I think any measurable impact will be uh, our satisfaction of scale. If I could add, um, scale is key for us to go into any intervention. Uh, and again, I believe the market-based approach is what leads to scale. But you're absolutely right in that the product is not sufficient. And Paul Pollock, our founder, everyone's quoting him, he, he said something famously to the fact of, if you get the product right, that's 2% of your solution. <laughs> the rest of the problem is around the business model, distribution, sales, marketing. How do you actually get product from source to end user? And that's where I think IDE adds a lot of value. We can do product design, and we do it very well because we know the user very well, but that's just the catalyst for the business model that will actually reach people at scale. And so in our more mature programs, uh, like in Cambodia, a lot of our resources are spent on developing sales networks, um, developing efficient supply chains, and that's how you get to scale. You have to make sure your supply chain actors are producing high quality product on time, and it's moving from source to end user. You have to make sure doors are knocked on, village chiefs are engaged, and it's not um, this magic bullet that you say, okay, we'll do a market-based approach, and boom, the market's on fire. You actually have to put in the hard work of knocking on doors and selling. And that might seem unsexy, but that's what it takes to get to scale. Great. Um, 
way in the back. Uh, Chef Ernest, Acre for All, uh, just to elaborate a little bit on this scalability, and I liked very much the answer from IDE, and on Thursday we will elaborate a little bit more on scaling safe water quality at, at point of use. What strikes me the last five, six years that we are very much involved in supporting business models in producing uh, household water treatment options, it is that Apparently, we have now more than 40, if not 60, producers and products. And we are competing on a market that doesn't exist. Because the penetration degree of safe water filters is less than 2%. Mm. And we are addressing a market of more than 4 billion people who don't have safe water. I'm not saying access to water, but I'm talking about access to safe water. That's why I have a question more not to the producers. I can understand they, they, they feel a kind of a competition, but there is no competition because there is no market. <laughs> I feel very much uh, 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 admiration for the way IDE is doing the market development and the, and the market-based approach. I would like to address the financiers, like Acro for All ourselves. What we should do, and I would like to have your comments on that, how can we achieve this scalability by putting our money, we can only spend it once, whether it is a grant, or we can spend it a little bit more efficiency and more intelligent. How can we finance the market development, demand creation? And that should go beyond the message of health and improving health conditions. It is all about these aspirational things. There are marketing studies that have studied why is it that the base no, not even the base, the bottom of the pyramid has access to mobile phones. And why don't they invest in a $10 filter? And that has something to do with investment which promises the perception. And with filters we promise health, but we can't guarantee. But Great. the mobile phone, it promises connection the very moment you put in a battery and some money. And that is the difference. So, please, from Grand Challenges Canada, could you elaborate a little bit more? How can we do a little bit more intelligent funding, creation of market, demand creation, and, uh, and, and, and promotion? Thank sure. you. Well, thank you. It's a great question, and I have the perfect answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I said at the beginning is that we've, uh, we've been evolving very, very rapidly, and where we're at right now is starting to think much, much more about systems. So I do, I do sincerely appreciate the, the question. Um, just before arriving in Stockholm, I was in Nairobi. Um, we have a couple of, including Afropads, a, a couple of menstrual hygiene management uh, investees or grantees within our portfolio. We're thinking of, at this point in our organization's evolution, how do we support them uh, beyond just that, that financing into the organization and then having them compete. East African market within, within, uh, with respect to menstrual hygiene management is extremely crowded uh, with all of these um, demand creation, uh, technical assistance, and very cottage industry manufacturers, as many of you likely know. We have a really interesting opportunity to start using different financing mechanisms. A couple that I'll throw out really quickly are Let's get some M&A activity, let's uh, establish some joint ventures, let's actually build a hold company or two in order to get these organizations to start um, partnering across the entire supply chain and more importantly, value chain. I wish I, had, I would be able to say that we figure this all out. Um, we are just starting to work on this very, very much so, focusing specifically on menstrual hygiene management and in East Africa as a start. Um, we are currently curating the entire space of menstrual hygiene management, trying to identify those most promising players within our portfolio, as well as all those that are not. We are starting to work with um, all the MHM experts, funders, in order to figure this thinking out a little bit more. And we are developing a community meeting um, in order to, to convene and discuss these actual next steps. Uh, I think we're aiming for very beginning of 2016. So uh, I'm very happy to speak to you about this more. Um, it's something that we are, we are identifying as a key need. You're exactly right. And I just wish I had a little bit more detail in terms of progress thus far. If I may add a point about the demand creation part. Um, I think in the sanitation space, there's this reputation 
that CLTS is known for demand creation and a market-based approach is known for um, setting up the supply chain. And IDE would really like to challenge that because the definition of a market is where supply and demand come together. And so, as I don't want to sound like a um, broken record, but the product is really the first step. You got to build up the product in the supply chain, but you got to make sure people actually want it. And part of that is designing something that people actually want. But just because you design something people actually want doesn't mean they're going to run out the door and go and buy it. So a lot of the efforts after you design the product and set up a supply chain is actually doing that demand creation. For us, it took us a while to kind of realize, whoa, if we're doing market-based approach, we should be considering ourselves as a sales organization, right? That's how sales organization, um, well, businesses measure success, sales. And sales in the BOP space um, isn't uh, retail shops, malls, and large commercial campaigns on TV. It's talking to people face-to-face, -face, helping them understand their concerns, uh, addressing their objections, and that's door-to-door -door sales. And so for us, IDE has recognized um, direct selling as a key best practice for building demand. Great. Um, the example that um, Jonathan gave of, of taking menstrual management project, products and trying to build a market, those sorts of studies have been done in a number of areas. It's in fact, one of those studies was, this, uh, was some of the work that PATH did for the um, uh, water, the water purification market. So those do exist. That one may need to be updated. Um, I hear you that there are a lot of products out there. Generally, there is a publication I would recommend in situations like this. Um, it was put out last year. It's called Beyond the Pioneer. And it is a case study of situations where um, products and services that serve the base of the pyramid have gone to scale. And what came out of that study is a very useful framework that goes from the product all the way up to the government level about what it takes to have a conducive enabling environment to get products to scale. So um, I, th there are both examples of, of studies that have been done as well as this broader framework that might be useful to that situation. So we've got time for one more question. Jeff, you clearly want to have the last question. <laughs> <laughs> we have two questions. <laughs> Thanks so much for the great panel. And um, I applaud the group for working with IDE, which in addition to pioneering treadle pumps, also in the point of use water filter, water product space is, I think, almost an outlier in terms of their success in Cambodia over the years. Um, but I wanna, I wanna caution the room that um, a lot of point of use water filters are sold in developing countries, lots of them. And I, when I say lots, I mean tens of millions. Um, in India, in Mexico, in Brazil, if you're, if you're an elite or even sort of a, work, a middle class consumer, um, you probably have a gravity driven filter of some kind in your home. Um, so the idea that, that these products aren't reaching consumers in developing countries is, is a myth. Um, I'm very glad that Eddie asked his, his customarily provocative question because um, <clears throat> you know, that's really the issue is how do you get to the, bit to the, to the poor and so I'd encourage you, um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking to our colleague from Kohler in particular, in addition to relying on both of IDE's long experience, of course, and the, um, the wealth of design um, research that was done by PATH in the, in the program that Lewis funded, there's more gold in them hills. And that gold is the gold of the, mark, of the market research that's been done over the years by a number of academic researchers, but also the likes of some of the world's biggest consumer products companies. I'm not gonna name them, but I think you can name them. And, and they've been in this space, and they've, and they've succeeded and failed in different contexts. So, anyway, I don't have a question, just, no, just but those two good. comments. And I'm gonna, yeah. um, that's helpful. And it, um, it's just about 3.30, we're gonna end now, and on time we're gonna start by thanking the three panelists for having the courage to stand up here and talk. And I also want to thank the audience for a series of really terrific and provocative questions. So thanks very much. Thank you.